Okay, so now refined painting. I want to do as much as I can without zooming in. So I, I can keep the big picture in mind. And without zooming in, I can see there's some places I definitely need some more refined highlight. It looks like his lips are open in my painting, but he has very, very, one of his kind of distinguishing features is he has these very full lips. Even though they are closed, they're, you know, like pillows. And so they have this strong highlight. And some strong pigment to them. Almost outlined. This has to do with the, the skin color around the lips just as much. As um, in the lip color itself. Curious if I get rid of, I make this 100%. Yeah, I think I'm gonna just view it like that from now on. You can really see these values clearly. See what still needs to be painted. So often pastel and crayon drawings, Conte crayon drawings, um, would work on a toned surface. So that you could clearly see where you're adding highlights versus adding shadow. And so the 50% gray background in Photoshop does that for you. Sets up a nice toned background. In fact, if you go to an art store and you buy pastel paper, it's a slightly textured paper, you know, help to help break up the the media. Oh, and I'm just painting on on my gray, which is a problem. So let me fix that right away. So what I will do is Take my base painting layer, select the outside of it, so I have that big shape, select the inverse, select that shape from the gray layer, so let me show you what I'm doing, like this, where I've painted some, <laughs> duplicate it, push that up above, and I'll call this the base gray layer. Shows how important underpainting is. The gray was showing me what I was missing. Now everything is locked and turned on. And now just refined painting is what I'm working on. Trying to stick with one brush, using it fairly consistently. Now this can be tricky because you want to have a light touch with your brush and yet you don't want to be tentative. So a light brush so that you don't just obliterate what's underneath and you're really using it, but still, you know, aggressive with your color, aggressive with your direction. And I tend to like with portraits, longer strokes rather than shorter strokes. You know, to help kind of blend the shapes together. So 
so the face doesn't look so splotchy, even though I want it to have all that color. And every once in a while, you do have to push kind of hard to set a really defined shadow form. And when you have to wait for Photoshop to catch up with you, that's a good time to save. But it's getting better and better, keeps building. Trying to bring the same level of finish to everything. That's the goal. Using layering to its ultimate effect. All right. So because it's taking quite a while for Photoshop to run, the file's over a gig, it's a good time. Ah. It is a good time to consolidate some layers. So I no longer need my base sketch layer. I no longer need these layers. I no longer need the base sketch layer. Everything else I need. So if I save from there, it will take up a little less space. It will save a little more quickly. I can look at what else I have open in Photoshop. What references do I really want? I do still want that because that's the overall finish I'm going for, especially in that hair. I don't know if I need this one anymore. I don't think I do. And I might swap this out for this, which I think is a little smaller as well. To steal colors from. Okay. Get on that refined painting layer, it saved me there. Sometimes I have to squint to see past my sketch lines to see the values underneath. And that's okay. I like using the, the art historical reference because of all the 
the colors that are in there that you don't really expect. And that's a weakness, I think, of digital painting. Contemporary examples is they aren't as adventurous in their color choices generally. Because it's easy to get stuck within a limited palette if that's all you have represented. Because you see, it's much easier just to steal colors from yourself. But if you see those greens in the Toulouse-Lautrec drawing, the expressive quality of them, this is his version of a portrait of Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh, himself was very expressive. You realize even when they had to pay for paints out of their, uh, their liquor money, <laughs> which was very valuable to them, they still experimented, even in quick sketches, with lots and lots of color. So you shouldn't be afraid of it. And I often kind of force myself to put that color in. Because then I know it's layered into the, the textures of the composition. And that's why I'll, I'll go between different references so that I have even more colors to, to be inspired by to work with, to choose from. Okay, I'm seeing it in the navigator, and I'm liking this new amount of um, depth we're building. These new kind of sienas from the Lautrec palette. giving that softness, but also that depth that I'm looking for. I don't want to ignore the ears, the depth of the value there. Often a good approach to working quickly is to put in something too dark and then work from the edges of it. forces you to deal with it right away. And with the darks, even though they don't really show it as clearly as the midtones of the highlights, there's a difference between brown black and blue black, orange black, The different darks matter. Uh, I don't like those artifacts. Let's see. It's good to have the history. So I'm working a little bit darker than I would so that I am forced to bridge up to that. because I've been a little tentative at these really dark values. It's like crayon. You know, sometimes you just have to use a dark crayon. And you try to soften it with crayons on top. And that's what I'll do. I think I do want the little bit of hair behind his ear. 